Hello, friends, and uh, welcome to the Science History Institute's Joseph Priestley Society November program. We are today talking about keeping it fresh sustainably, how flexible packaging uh, lowers food waste and, and makes things a whole lot better for the world uh, by preserving food and, and uh, uh, conserving resources. So. Everybody talks about sustainability at the Joseph Priestley Society. We've been talking about it all fall and uh, we've been talking mostly about carbon and, and air quality and water quality and things like that. So this November program, we thought it would be good to look at a side of it that many people don't think of when they think of the word sustainability and that is food, food waste, food packaging, food preservation and the whole general subject of feeding people and keeping people from, from being hungry. So this morning, um, this morning, this afternoon, uh, I have with me, I'm, I'm Bob Kenworthy and I'm a member of the Joseph Priestley Society Program Committee and I'm your host this afternoon. I have with me three experts from the flexible packaging industry, Evan Arnold from Glenroy, Scott Hammer from CNG, and Sal Poingra from uh, uh, Pro Ampac. And what I'd like to do to get us started is, uh, is have the three of them introduce themselves and their corporate affiliations so you know who's talking and who you're talking with. Uh, before I do that, if you have a question for any of us, just put it in the chat and we'll monitor that and we'll get the questions asked. Otherwise, I'll be asking questions and they'll be providing erudite answers. So. Um, but let's do this in alphabetical order, if I may. Uh, Evan, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and uh, your company? Sure. Uh, thanks, Bob, for having us on and excited to talk about the flexible packaging industry here with all of you. Uh, I'm Evan Arnold. I work for Glenroy Incorporated. I lead our product development and quality teams here. And we are a flexible packaging converter specializing in high barrier food solutions. We're located out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin and been in business for over 55 years. And the biggest takeaway here is, you know, Glenroy's purpose is to deliver sustainable solutions to serve the next generation. So our focus is, is about delivering flexible packaging solutions to help combat food waste and also deliver on recyclability and eco impact of our films out there to the consumers. Thanks, Devin. All right. Next alphabetically, Scott. Okay, very good. Thank you, Bob. I, I am going to share my screen here. So Scott Hammer, uh, Director of Corporate Sustainability with the Charter Next Generation. I have been with uh, them a little over six years now and I've been in the flexible packaging industry uh, for 35 plus years. So. Um, a little bit about CNG. Um, we are a uh, North America's leading independent producer of uh, highly engineered specialty films. We do uh, over 900,000, uh, I'm sorry, 900 uh, million pounds. Um, we've got 13 different sites uh, with over 100 extrusion lines, both blown film and cast, uh, 1,700 employees. Our key markets that we, we serve, not limited to, but primarily food, consumer, industrial, and healthcare. Um, and I'm gonna get my cursor down where I need to be here. Uh, these are our locations uh, across the United States, uh, four in Wisconsin, uh, three in Ohio, uh, Massachusetts, and South Carolina as well. And we have the same type of mentality, a sustainability first mindset, uh, helping companies of all sizes really invest and create packaging uh, with sustainability in mind. And that's either from a reduction standpoint, reuse standpoint or recycling. And we can get into some more of that information a bit later. So um, basically our strategy is focused on enabling circularity. And uh, my two cohorts here are, are a, a couple of customers that we truly enjoy working with that are leading edge when it comes from a sustainability standpoint. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. We look forward to uh, this discussion. Thank you very much, Scott. And Sal Palingra from Pro Ampac, uh, you are up next. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me, and uh, great to be uh, be on here with, with Scott and Evan. Um, 
Um, I've been with ProAntec um, about 15 years. I've been in flexible packaging for, for a lot longer than that. I uh, teach packaging at um, 25 patents. I, um, I focus a lot on um, what's new, like new materials. You know, are there more sustainable materials, different, different types, whether it's pulp-based or, or uh, polymer-based, um, how, how we put those together. Um, and um, I'm very externally focused with customers. Um, I'll just share a couple quick slides. Um, <laughs> so you can see a pretty wide range of what we do. Um, about 50% of our of what we um, purchase is um, in raw materials is paper, um, and the rest is, is polymer based. Um, we kind of believe sort of, uh, um, you know, you use paper um, wherever, um, wherever it's applicable and, and we use films wherever those are applicable and um, I think it just in general when you think about what everybody's trying to do with sustainability it's using the right materials and the right types of packages and in, in the right places um, and you can see the broad range that we do we um, we're very um, we have been North American based but but we've had a whole mess of acquisitions we've had 10 this year um, a lot of those are in the UK, and uh, we even purchased a um, a uh, paper mill in the US that um, only produces paper from 100% re recycled materials. So nothing new, all post-consumer materials to make that paper. A pretty broad reach, and um, a quick plug for Collaboration and Innovation Center. I'm spending uh, um, a couple of years in Rochester, New York, um, where we're working on um, where we can test those materials, make prototypes, um, test those on, on machines that our customers might have, have physical and analytical labs, um, food testing in there. We have turbo chefs, retort chambers, microwaves, and, and ovens as well. And, um, and we focus on reduce first. How can you use less packaging, ship more product? And then um, there are different areas in those recyclable, compostable, adding PCR and renewable as we, we help our customers um, meet their goals. So thanks for having me and uh, I'll stop sharing and we're back to you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sal. So let's get into the discussion. Uh, you know, the, uh, the first element of, um, of sustainability is resource conservation. I mean, we, we, we all talk about uh, how, how we can use less material, but one of the fundamental underpins of the packaging industry is preserving food and reducing the amount of food waste, um, which is uh, a big deal. When we, when we deal with hunger programs broadly across the world, we tend to focus on the growing side or the raising side and, and talking about how can we grow more to feed the expanding population. And yet uh, uh, food waste is a big deal when it comes to uh, food productivity, if you please. And Evan, I know you gave a presentation to PAC Expo at the end of September, I believe. And uh, uh, one, one of the keys of your presentation was uh, food waste and reducing food waste. So would you like to say a little bit about food waste and how flexible packaging uh, uh, works to minimize that? Yeah, absolutely. And it, the amazing part is, as I was working on building that uh, presentation was understanding just how much food is in our landfills. And, you know, it's upwards of 30% is food waste. And thinking about what I and our company and all three of our organizations do every day is find and build solutions to protect that food better. And so as we look at not only extending shelf life of products so that it can get to more people, also working to understand how we can improve shelf life once that package is open. So what can we do to, once it's open, protect that food, whether it's in your refrigerator or in your pantry, so that people can use that food longer. Uh, we've certainly found that flexible packaging has a lower impact to our environment compared to rigid counterparts. So how can we use less plastic and in a better way to protect our food longer? And we certainly developed a few solutions that help our customers extend the shelf life of those packages once opened. Thank you. Either Scott or Sal, you wanna jump in on that? Yeah, I'll jump in just from a sustainability standpoint. I mean, there are obviously challenges with the current uh, type of mixed material structures for 
making sure that we do uh, the best thing for the, the, the food packaging application. And sustainability is no different. We need to make sure that we continue to maintain, if not improve upon, uh, the protection of, of whatever is being packaged with sustainable options, whether that be all PE, um, PCR containing, um, et cetera. So um, the, 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 the challenge remains the same, but the, um, the, the end use is, or the, the end goal is absolutely uh, something that we need to maintain and sustainability. We've been able to do that um, without sacrificing really or compromising any of the packagings that we do from a sustainability standpoint. So the, the first thing, the first thing is food safety. I mean, we, we're not going to put food out in the marketplace that isn't safe for consumers. So uh, um, that that's where we start, and then we talk about how we do that in a way that conserves resources. So, thank you. So uh, as, as we look at those uh, flexible structures, and yeah, you know, I think it's intuitively obvious to people that. Flexible packaging uses fewer pounds of paper and plastic than rigid packaging does. Okay? But nonetheless, uh, there's some limitations to that and some reasons why uh, um, rigid packaging uh, uh, is still used. A lot largely has to do with, uh, with um, uh, damage uh, uh, avoidance, if you please, in shipping. But, uh, when, when we look when we look at the uh, um, the structure that actually comes in contact with the food, however, it, the way we the way we minimize resources is to make that as thin as possible. So um, maybe I'll phrase the question this way, and Scott, maybe this starts with you since you're a, a material supplier. What what are the advanced materials? What are the what are the materials of today? That enable you to uh, to address sustainability more effectively in in direct food contact or indirect food contract uh, with the flexible materials. Well, I'll start from from a food manufacturing standpoint. Is you know there's new resins that that come out all the time that um, um, allow us the ability to utilize that resin for specifically what it's been designed for and. It's not just the materials coming out, it's the equipment that's been made available to us. Uh, you know, things have, you know, gone from mono layer to three layer to five layer and more. And so now in conjunction with the resin technology that we have, um, you can now put resins in discrete layers to help um, create a package that will give you the, the optics, the barrier, the strength properties and do it at a thinner gauge um, and, uh, and without sacrificing other uh, requirements for the package. So it's really a, a combination of materials as well as processing equipment. Mm -hmm. and, our... and any specific materials that uh, say in the last uh, 10 years have been uh, uh, breakthrough for you? Well, I, th I think there's always things that come out from uh, you know, barrier standpoints uh, where you can create the barrier um, and without having to sacrifice optics, but uh, more on the sealant side of things that allow us to, you know, better caulk, better flow, um, you know, maybe minimize that sealant layer a little bit more in order to achieve the same performance, but with less material. So um, to me, that's really been uh, the, the key technology advancements has been on the sealant side. Okay. And I would I would jump in um, quick. I mean, one on the rigid to flexible. Um, rigid definitely has its place. There's there's products that we like in rigid, but um, with the pandemic, it really increased the amount of e-commerce that was going that um, you know we're using, we're ordering online, whether it's groceries or or um, um, you know products from Amazon or or whoever. Um, rigid materials often need void fill around them to protect them and then they go into packaging and so you're shipping more packaging to protect that rigid package and we're seeing more and more opportunities um, or, or brands that are looking at how can we protect that product with less packaging and also put less packaging around it so um so flexible packaging for e-commerce or they're looking at um you know omni channel should we change all of our packaging and reduce it some some brands are doing that. Some are saying, we like the way our packaging works in retail, 
but with this growing e-commerce, we're moving to less packaging and packaging that doesn't get damaged um, as easily. And so, so we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, and in terms of food spoils, it's kind of interesting. Um, it was maybe, I can't remember, eight, eight or so years ago when, when in the UK they were wrapping individual bananas and putting them in a, in a package. And there was all, all kinds of, uh, even some of the late night hosts were getting on, on them for that. But what, what happened with that is one, they got rid of the plastic that was around the, the entire bundle inside. And two, it increased the shelf life um, by a little over seven days. And they were able to put bananas in vending machines in, in schools for children as an alternative to snacks. And so it was reducing the amount of waste. I think they were throwing away, I forget what it was, 1.5 million bananas a day. It reduced that. Um, allowed kids in school to eat something healthier, um, but it did increase packaging on individual ones. So it, it reduced food waste in that way. And um, we don't often look at um, the differences in food waste. Now, you, it, without that, you would have to grow more bananas, ship them around, you know, harvest them, get them to where they need to be um, versus, you know, protecting them and providing a longer shelf life. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Sale. It's uh, it's interesting to show how packaging can help, but you know we need to create some of that same emotion that is out there for you know against because that is a huge benefit of flexible packaging. And how can we help educating people on these benefits of flexible packaging by extending the shelf life? And I think doing that within the food area would really help um, kind of drive some of that new wave and uh, positivity around how plastics can help uh, eliminate food waste. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we talked about barrier. I'm not sure our audience uh, understands barrier in the same way that we all do it, who've worked in this industry for a while. Uh, and we got a question in the chat room that says, can you discuss the importance of air, water, and microbes as causes of spoilage? So we talk about barrier. We're talking about oxygen barrier. We're talking about moisture barrier. Uh, and we're talking obviously about uh, keeping food from uh, from microbiological attacks. So who, who wants to jump in on that one? I can hit it really, really quick and, and I'll let you guys jump in. But um, if you think of just in simple terms, if you have a dry product, you need to keep it dry, right? So you need moisture from the outside not to get in. If you have a wet product, you uh, need um, to keep that moisture inside the package. And so a moisture barrier does both things. Um, you know, we don't want an apple to get dried out, or you don't want, uh, you know, a, a wet drink. You know, you can't have a drink that's 16 ounces and it's and it's evaporating and you're down to 14 ounces, um, just in general. And with oxygen, um, we don't want oxidation and spoilage. So if you ever eaten a bad potato chip, um, it's 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 oxidizing and it's spoiling, and there's all kinds of ketones and other things happening inside there. So, um, so you want to keep oxygen from getting in where some fruits and vegetables need to respire and we might need breathable films. So um, just in general, um, controlling that. And if you control like for, for produce, that respiration, you can keep that product fresh longer. Um, and, and that was the case with uh, the banana example that I had before. Um, jump, jump in there, Scott or uh, Evan. No, that that was as clear as you could get there, Sal. I mean, there's there's different ways to achieve those barriers, you know, whether through resin technology, it could be coating technology, whatever it may be. Um, so there's there's available avenues for that. Um, it's just finding the right the right fit uh, for the application that a customer might be looking for. And so there, there there's certainly options out there. And also from a sustainability standpoint, there's there's options certainly available. So people just don't need to zero in on the mixed materials. I mean, really, we have sustainable options for all of these types of apps. Yeah, that's a good point, Scott. And I think there's a lot of learning going on. In the past, we would use these mixed materials because it was easy. We knew <clears throat> the solutions there. And as we're working towards mono and sustainable film offerings, we're kind of learning with our customers about how we can uh, deliver those same barriers, whether it's moisture or oxygen or both of those together to protect their products in the long run and protect consumers, really. 
Yeah, and and Evan, you you mentioned uh, earlier res um, resealability as another element of uh, helping the consumer conserve food. Uh, and we got a question about uh, consumer friendly innovation that, and with reclosable or reclosure systems. Would you like to say more about that? Sure, one of the uh, case studies that I highlighted as a presentation at PEC Expo was we produce a, uh, a guacamole and avocado pouch that once opened, we still have an oxygen barrier through a valve. So it allows the consumer to squeeze and use that guacamole on demand for any types of their different applications. I feed it to my children every morning uh, on the toast. <laughs> Um, the beauty of that is it extended the shelf life uh, like three or four times what a current avocado was getting. So in that package, they print right on there that this product is good for up to 14 days. And, uh, you know, I know when I open and cut open an avocado within two hours, it's oxidizing already and, and getting brown. So delivering innovative solutions uh, to help consumers extend that shelf life, but also use it differently and more convenient for them is, is really kind of the ultimate goal there. And uh, we think we succeeded within that package uh, for sure. Great. And, and jumping jumping on that um, quick, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. One, um, the films that um, Scott produces, one is making sure that you have hermetic seals, right? So you're not losing air through through the seal areas and um, some of those. And then on the reclose, just think of things like a potato chip bag. You open it, you have to find something to reclose that. Um, Target has a, a, a front face zipper on, on theirs. And uh, they mentioned, this was on there quite a while ago. Um, I think their sales went up almost 15% when they put that zipper on. And they're the only ones still in the market with a zipper on their potato chip bag. Um, and um, so having a reclose is a, is a huge benefit um, because you're able to close that. It's, it's, you're, you're reducing exposure to the environment um, through that. So like Evan's example with, with um, spouts and one-way valves and, you know, lids on a spouted pouch or zippers on, you know, on a regular pouch, having a reclose is key. And, and we all find find ways to do that in our house with cheese, wrapping them up, putting them in, in a Ziploc bag or whatever. So if you can put it on the primary package, you're not using another package, you know, to, to uh, put that product into afterwards. Right, and, and that's a key element of sustainability as, as Philip pointed out in our chat room is that yeah. the, the consumer doesn't have to find another plastic bag to put the product in after they've opened the original package. Exactly. So you're using a lot less material that way. Well, thinking the same as me. Yeah, right. So, so what are what are the challenges? You know, everything can't be uh, uh, sweetness and roses, right? I mean, there's got to be some uh, some deliberate uh, or some uh, significant challenges to uh, to minimizing food waste, to keeping food fresh, and doing it sustainably. What would you identify as the significant challenges you're facing? You know, I, I, I can start it just from the sustainability standpoint, because that's where I'm always going to lead from, is with the current structures that are out there now, mixed materials, is trying to duplicate the performance of those films on the packaging lines. While you're still packaging the same materials on the same packaging lines, when you start getting away from a polyester, polyethylene type of structure now into an all PE structure, how can you best optimize the materials on both ends to create you know, an optimum temperature differentials from an ability for you know, sealing at you know, good production speeds without additional waste? And how do you maintain some of those properties like a polyester with high heat resistance? How can you achieve that with a PE type of structure? So there's a lot of, advancements that have gone on, you know, technology wise, you know, production, film production wise, to help us start narrowing that gap between all PE and mixed materials. There is still a gap, but, um, you know, equipment now is being made that's uh, designed to run all PE structures, but it is going to constantly be a challenge, especially as you can get to higher performance lines, higher speed lines, and even products that are going to require more demanding uh, protection. So, 
it's it's always going to be a challenge out there, but it's it's one that we're certainly up to and one that we've been able to achieve success in many, many different areas. Yeah, Scott makes an interesting point. We're here from the converters, innovators within the supply chain, and, and we've brought a lot of innovation to, to food packaging and sustainability. And we need to work with the brands who are going to sell that to the consumers and and they're leveraging all sorts of different things their current infrastructure that's maybe not set up for this new wave of sustainable packaging and convincing them that taking the leap and that this is what the consumers want they're hearing it from the consumers as well and then also the back end side of things is designing for the current state of recyclability and what current uh, material recovery facilities can utilize and designing within them, but also designing for the future. And how do we build that infrastructure for the future so we can utilize more sustainable films and uh, better protecting films for our products, but also build up that infrastructure so they can be recycled and reused and made back into packaging. So there's all these different factors that come into play that Scott, Sal, and I can sit back here and design the most sustainable, best food package ever, but we have to have all these other levers work in our favor as well. Yeah, Evan, that's such a great point. So um, um, one, a lot of packaging that's out there could be recycled today if there was infrastructure. Um, two, we're trying to design packaging that will have higher value um, for that recycle, uh, recycled material. And that's that's where the drive to more mono materials or more light materials um, is going. So even though you may not be able to collect those today, you know if we can drive things from multi material to a mono material or or at least keep some of those other materials down to lower percentages, so we can still recycle um, is key. I think the biggest challenge that I see is is just that people look at this whole thing from such a micro view. Um, so someone might just go, plastic's bad. So let's go to paper. And, you know, what are you going to do? Imagine changing the paper, you know, overnight, and there wouldn't be trees anywhere. I mean, if anyone's ever been, seen um, North Korea or Haiti, where there were no resources, and there's no trees um, anywhere, um, it's, uh, it's pretty bleak. Um, so, um, also, uh, just saying, you know, we want something that can be recycled today. Well, then you're not focusing on the future and, and there isn't an infrastructure today. So California is changing some laws and just saying, you know, we're, we're, we're going to put in, we're going to tax people and you can't say anything's recyclable if it can't be collected curbside today. Well, then you're stifling the work for tomorrow as well. And so, um, so it's, it's the, the main thing is how can you look at things holistically and how can we start just driving towards materials that are that are more recyclable in general um, and two also not driving to to products that are going to affect food waste and that's a huge thing um, I can't oh, was it France I think is putting a law in currently that um, produce can't have any packaging on it at all. Now imagine the food waste that's going to happen because of that. Um, so, um, so not looking at things from a micro level, not being reactive, but looking at things more holistically in, in general. Right. And, and Sal, you, you mentioned, uh, switching from plastic to paper as a, a wholesale, uh, move. Uh, we got a question about, uh, compostability. Uh, you know, are there are there modern materials that allow normal household composting systems to operate better than they did in the past? So, so um, um, a, a little bit on that. I'm sorry, sorry, Scott. Um, a little bit on that, and then I'll let Scott jump in. But in general, um, we can produce products that are home compostable um, as well as industrial compostable. The key is is the infrastructure isn't there, number one, and consumers don't have the education to understand even home compost, you have to generate heat inside that container and you have to mix it. And, you know, um, so there are specifications for that, but just think in general, in order for something to break down, um, it's got to dissolve easily. So if we want to protect products, just like we had talked about before, you need moisture barrier. That's going to work against you in the compost um 
um, even even oxygen barrier, when you're building in that barrier, that works against you. So the biggest challenge is um, designing in barrier that will protect food products while still being able to recycle. So um, if there's things like you buy a hamburger at McDonald's, which which please don't do that um, in general, <laughs> but that comes in a paperboard uh, curtain. And if there's food waste in there and that paperboard is recyclable, then then area, those are areas where it's it's a great um, combination. So you're recycling the food waste with the packaging waste. That's probably one of the best areas to try to do that. But in general, a lot of education, a lot of training um, in compostability, a lot of infrastructure in, in order to do that. Yeah, and, and I'll second that. You're right on, Sal. I mean, it's really infrastructure right now that, that is the biggest concern from my viewpoint is you know, recycling um, and you know, store drop-off, uh, packaging. You know, that's a challenge in itself. When you take go to compostability, it's, it's, it's even more of a challenge. But there are films out there um, you know, that, that can be used. They're limited in the gauges, the thicknesses that they can be used, which is a good thing uh, because it helps them from a compostability standpoint. But as Sal alluded to, there are certainly some um, challenges when it comes to property, uh, either from a strength standpoint or a barrier standpoint, where what you can do with a typical uh, mixed material structure right now from a compostability standpoint may be difficult. I mean, there's going to be things like store drop out or store carry out bags. Um, it might be standalone for um, you know, certain type of uh, food products that, you know, especially if there's a little bit of waste associated with a residual contamination where it really renders it unrecyclable, that may be a good opportunity for a compostable standpoint. But there's, there's work constantly being done on the compostability front. And you know I, I see that as gaining definitely more traction as we go into 2022 and beyond. Um, and there's more brands that are kind of looking at that as a potential end of life scenario for some other packaging needs. So um, the key is really to have all different formats available for a customer to use, depending upon the solution that their specific product and philosophy is going to need. Right, and, and you talked about you talked about the education required. You know, uh, Sal, you talked about the McDonald's clamshell. Uh, you know, the uh, the other example for me is uh, pizza boxes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's impossible to have a paperboard pizza box that doesn't have food contamination. Uh, so, which then renders it uh, uh, hard to recycle, if not un unrecyclable. So maybe the best place to look for uh, uh, compostability is in consumer pizza boxes. So, um, so I will jump in to uh, advance their chemical recycling. So mechanical recycling for f flexible packaging in North America right now is only through um, in-store recycling. And they, they only accept um, clean dry products that were in those. If you have a wet product that's contaminated, we know consumers aren't very good at cleaning it out. But if you can get that to a chemical chemical recycling facility, um, they can recycle that with food waste in there, with liquid waste in there, and it doesn't affect um, um, any of their efficiencies. And so the other thing is with advanced recycling, it's, it's, it's unlimited recycling. You can just recycle, 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 and it, and what you get out of there works as well as as um, virgin. Where with mechanical, every heat history, it's it's you're breaking down that polymer a little bit. So, so folks like um, Scott have to do all kinds of work to make that um, act like uh, a new film, <laughs> you know, instead of something that has materials in it that are breaking down and carbon and all this other stuff in there. So, so how far do we go with, uh, with chemical breaking down? Do we go all the way back to monomers and, and ask the polymer producers to reproduce the polyethylene? So that's pretty much what they do. They're, they're using forms of paralysis and, and they're getting the monomer back again. So you can do this with polyester, you can do it with um, polypropylene, you can do it with polyethylene, and, and more and more of the resin companies are coming on because we need PCR. Um, you know, there's more and more commitments and legislation that are requiring it, and we need um, we need avenues to get that, and that's one big avenue that can recycle a large amount. Um, the key is is how do we get this flexible packaging 
to the chemical recycler so that we can recycle it. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Sal. We as a society need to continue to look at this from a from a broad view and not focus into the current recycling infrastructure we have being just mechanical. There are much better ways to, to recycle and reuse the packaging that we have now. And you know, sometimes the quick answer for these the communities is to just focus on the right now and and we have to do our part to to think broader about that design for the future but also build the infrastructure for the future there and that, that infrastructure post-consumer infrastructure is is what you're talking about there uh, the polymer manufacturers do a lot of recycle uh, within their own manufacturing facilities mm -hmm but that's only a, a fraction of the amount of material that gets out into the world. Right. Yeah, and if you go to Japan or Germany or even Italy, some of these other countries, the consumers are, are very well trained and educated. I mean, sometimes there's eight or nine different bins and they're, they're pretty meticulous. They're, mm -hmm. they're taking things and, oh, this one goes in that one, this goes in that, I got to pull this off and, um, Unfortunately, in the U.S., we're not um, as disciplined, and um, we need more of that discipline. So, one, we're not overwhelming the recyclers with materials that they can't recycle, and, and two, we're 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 starting to separate those in the files that make them easier to recycle. Yeah, and and so where where is the fine point? You know, do we do we try to build structures that are all uh, single polymer structures, because that way the consumer doesn't have to be that well educated about separation uh, or, or do we educate the public about separating and you know I think of I think of uh, uh, soda bottles you know polyester soda bottles were one of the early recycle uh, capable packages um, but then they put a polypropylene closure on it right so then they had to skive the whole neck off in order to uh, eliminate the polypropylene from the polyester recycle uh, what do you what do you see as the balance point on that? Well, the, the 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 problem. Sorry, Scott. I, Go ahead, man. <laughs> I don't know, filter sometimes. I just jump in. So uh, the problem is is um, you, you need different materials for different applications, and so um, low lower heat applications PE works. When it, when you get into higher heat, then you have to move to polypropylene, or um, if you need some toughness, sometimes nylon is needed, or you know polyester is needed. So. Some of these different materials are required for different applications. We're never going to drive to one material, um, and and we won't drive to just flexible versus rigid either. Um, the key is the least amount of material that you can, the right material for that for that the right application, um, and then driving these as much as possible to structures that can be recycled, whether it's mechanical or, or chemical. Sorry, sorry, Scott, jump in. Boy, you took the words right out of my mouth there, Sal. That's, that was awesome. But that's that's exactly it. You're, you're always going to have a combination. I mean, our our drive is to go sustainability first. What can we do from an all PE work and you know structure versus mixed materials? But as Sal indicated, there's some applications that you're just not going to be able to replace with an all PE structure just because of either the process, the product being packaged, et cetera. And when you have those cases of uh, where you can't get away from the mixed materials, what can you do then from incorporation of PCR content, post-consumer recycled content? At least you get something back into a structure, albeit it may not be recyclable, be the, the, the current mechanically recycled, but at least you're getting something in there that maybe from an advanced recycling standpoint, we can get her broken down. And I see out, out there in the future is you're always gonna have a combination of mechanically and chemically recycled PCR in a structure because uh, you're going to look to maximize it. You don't want to uh, take away from the current mechanically recycled folks and, and give to the advanced. You want to continue to have that source of supply. Uh, but what advanced will give you will the ability to increase that content even more than what you've got right now because the ability to put it in the in the layers that you normally would not consider putting PCR content. So there is a lot of things going on there that that, that are going to be fun to deal with. Um, but it's also additional tools in the old tool belt that's going to help us design better packaging for the application and optimize uh, the sustainability uh, perspective. Yeah, I think, I think you both said it really well. And, 
And I got to highlight uh, to Sal's last comment here, uh, we within the industry need to do everything we can to, to design for current recyclability and future. But we as consumers have to take some of that on ourselves and we have to be a part of the solution along with the industry and along with everybody else. We have to be as educated as possible if we really want to solve uh, some of these waste challenges we have. And, and we got a question on uh, cost effectiveness too. And maybe Scott, this comes to you because you're the producer here. Uh, the question is, is it cost effective for manufacturers to use materials that come from post-consumer recycled sources? <laughs> All right, here's a sustainability guy that's gonna dabble a little bit with pricing, which is always a little dangerous. So I'll keep it somewhat <laughs> fair. But uh, yeah, right now, um, recycled, materials, recycled content, especially post-consumer are definitely, uh, I would say higher than a virgin resin at this point. Um, but from my perspective is um, there is an urgency to get to the utilization of this material and we need to continue to do that. If it's looking for, you know, niche applications to get your foot, you know, in the door, get comfortable with the performance, you know, you don't have to start with a 60% PCR containing structure. Start with something low, get it in there, get it evaluated, minimize the cost impact. Um, and then as you gain, you know, uh, confidence with it, you can increase the PCR content. And hopefully those, those recycled content uh, or those recycled uh, materials will start coming down. Um, you know, and as we drive demand, hopefully, you know, the supply will improve, the quality improve, and we'll start seeing things come back down. But, uh, I think there will always be a slight premium when it comes to the use of uh, PCR materials. Um, but in the long run, with anything sustainability, I, I think there's a little bit more of a cost associated with that. And it's a matter of what you consider a priority uh, within your, your, your company's sustainability initiative. So. And, and maybe let me add that then to Evans and Sal's uh, bag of uh, questions and say, from your point of view, uh, are the brand managers at the uh, companies uh, more accepting of the higher cost uh, in order to be able to say it contains X percent PCR? Um, so um, great question, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, it depends on the brand and, and, and who it is. We have some that um, are really committed to this change and are willing to, you know, to pay what it costs for, for something that's more recyclable or, or it has that PCR in. Um, it's not a conversation with, with um, a large um, um, retailer and um, the purchasing knows that it's come, but right now they're not incented on the change yet. And so, so they're at, if the cost is at parity or, or an improvement will change, but until until my objectives change, we're not going to change yet. And so, um, so you have some conflicting. Um, and then I was talking to one brand who it, it related to the food waste. They were so committed to this change, um, their shelf life was going to go from from twenty four months to nine months to to make a change. But they were incentive. Their job was to find a recyclable structure that could run at the same efficiencies. They weren't. Re they weren't focused on food waste, um, and so, so it's a mixed bag in general. Um, um, but as we get closer and closer to 2025, and as legislation changes, more and more, more and more companies and, and um, retailers are going to make that change. You know, whether it costs or not. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that same thing to sales point. It's uh, it's a total mixed bag out there. Everybody's certainly looking for these solutions. And we have two tech service reps that their whole job is to work with our customers on improving and working within their current infrastructure, their packaging lines to run these new types of films. And a lot of times what we hear is if we can run it as efficiently and you can help us, we're okay with some of that extra payment because they're going to get the benefit from the marketing and 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 hopefully be able to drive that to the consumers and, and drive more products sold because of their packaging. So it's really a it, it's really a toss up right now. But we're 2021, almost 2022, and uh, yeah, we got a lot of brands have about three years to transition some of this packaging. So we're going to see that really start to pick up, I believe. 
And you've, you've talked about this 2025 uh, uh, date. Um, and let me come back and question it this way. Is, it, is all of this change being driven by legislation or regulation, or is it uh, some, some real consumer desire that's uh, playing here as well? Somebody, somebody told me the reason for the 2025, and I, I can't remember, it was some sort of six year, I forget what it was, but it was kind of interesting. But everyone's uh, put that stake in the ground for 2025. Um, and the question on, on some of the legislation. Um, so the pros are <clears throat> legislation that's forcing people to make a change. And um, so to me, that that is um, needed. The negative are is the legislation that is um, reactionary and, and without a lot of data. So we even work with the Flexible Packaging Association to try to influence some of the legislation so that it makes sense. Um, there was there was some that was being proposed that um, that was only going to tax packaging that was not recyclable, and so um, a glass would be considered recyclable. But it's not being recycled in a whole mess of places because it's heavy and really costly. I was at a Murph in Pennsylvania and, and they're collecting it and crushing it up and using it as layers over over some of some of the, the trash that they're bearing, the landfill. Um, that wouldn't be penalized. So you could you could go to really heavy, expensive packaging that you can't that is recyclable, but it's not being recycled versus the least amount of packaging. Um, that isn't recycling. Um, flexible packaging is adding, adding, I don't know, it's it's a little over 3%, I think, of what ends up in landfills. Um, food is, uh, I think, over 20%. So, so the legislation has to make sense. Um, <clears throat> and so we need educated people to help educate not only consumers, but the, the folks putting legislation into place. And so, so in general, it's good when it's done right, but it's bad when it's done wrong. And just to piggyback on that, it has to be aligned. I mean, we can't have 50 different states with 50 different bills. I mean, that's, that's going to be a nightmare to deal with. So to me, there's got to be something from the federal level that's going to help, um, you know, hopefully even things out uh, because right now we've got a couple bills that have gone uh, into law, I guess, in, in, in Maine and Oregon, and we need to make sure that we try to get all of these different states or future states aligned so uh, the industry is not chasing itself and trying to figure out how we're going to conform with one state versus another. So that's going to be very important. Yeah. yeah and, that, and that's the role for a trade association like the Flexible Packaging Association to try to, uh, to get that alignment to do the education of the legislators uh, in such a way that uh, you don't have 50 people writing 50 different bills, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So then where, where do we go with uh, the future? We've talked a little bit about designing for the future as well as designing to, to meet current infrastructure. So the future for infrastructure is uh, uh, one element of that. How about the future for materials? Um, is there, is there a material characteristic that you'd love to have, but you don't currently have? Oh. Well, <laughs> we want it all, all the time, you know? Yeah, right, right. And to, to narrow it down, uh, boy, that's, uh, that, that's, I guess it all depends upon the application and the product being packaged. I mean, to me, I think one of the, the more difficult, um, um, challenges right now from a packaging standpoint is maybe larger format packages that uh, you typically have nylon in that gives you some strength to pass drop tests and stuff like that. So I was kind of looking for, if I put on my wish list, you know, something that uh, is nylon like that's not nylon, but you know, there's also things going on with the testing of nylon from a recyclability standpoint that I'm encouraged by. So it's, that's kind of where you find yourself in this, in this, you know, do I or don't I? It's, as, as Evan referenced is, you know, the future state is if nylon does get, you know, like it has in, in Europe to a certain percentage approved for recycling, can that happen in the States? So do you really want to design around that or do you want to design it in complement to, to have a couple options depending upon a customer's viewpoint? But I'm going to throw out toughness just to, to get the ball rolling, but uh, you know, it all really depends upon the product being packaged, in my opinion. Guys, 
I, I agree. I don't know if we're waiting for some magic uh, material. Uh, Scott's got all the wonderful material already here for us. Uh, I, I would like us as an industry and a, as a broader society to maybe come together on on what is that what is that thing we're going to get behind is it recycling is it compostability is it chemical advanced recycling or some of the other newer technologies that make sense for the us here right what's going on across the world might not make sense but there are solutions that we can do and and the industry here specifically the plastics industry and i think you've seen it through the innovation we're on board we're not we're not saying no to any of this stuff. We just want it to make sense for consumers and as easy as possible for the consumers. So I guess my magic wish is that we can decide together on something that makes sense, which in today's world <laughs> is a huge challenge. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, for me, um, I just say, I mean, the, the, the ideal packaging for me is the least amount of packaging. So I, I'm in, I'm a, up with our innovation center. I'm in Rochester, New York, and I'm staying at a cottage and there's 40 steps down to the cottage. And uh, when I bring groceries, it's all these big rigid things that drive me crazy. Cause <laughs> they, you know, if you're in a paper bag, they're breaking the bags and they fall down and they break and you just can't carry them. And, um, to me, the least amount of packaging when I'm carrying it down and carrying the packaging back up, um, that's that's where I'd want to be. And, and that's what I'd like to strive for. And then to Scott's point, like how do you make it um, tougher so that it can go there? And to Evan's point, how can you make it so that you can handle it and pour out of it and it's functional? Um, that's where um, the guacamole example that um, Evan highlighted is, is a great one. Um, so the least amount of packaging um and then how can we get the highest value for it how can we collect it with infrastructure and then how, how can we get the highest value so that it's sustainable um not in not in sustainability then but sustainable in the sense that 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 whole infrastructure will work and you can recycle and and, and use it again um create that whole circular economy well, certainly minimizing minimizing weight is the uh, mantra of the flexible packaging industry from the very beginning. Yeah. So Philip's question is is an interesting one. Um, the different sizes and shapes and styles of, of, of packaging. Um, <clears throat> one, one of the biggest things with food waste is is when we have these large packages. So just think of a, a large package of eight six or eight chicken breasts and you bring it home and, and cook two and then you roll up the package and you put it in the freezer and then then a month later you go back in there and it's freezer burned and dried out and then you're like eh, so so that's not good or you know a, you know bag of vegetables and you only cook part of it so one the reclosability but two portioning it so why not have three packages of two chicken breasts inside that big bag and then you take two out and the rest stay fresh, you know, and they're they're not wasted. So, so there's a there's a place for portioning, I think, and um, and that's again where excess packaging. It's a little excess packaging, but you're you're reducing the food waste. So, um, so packaging for convenience and for um, you know and right sizing packaging is key. But um, I don't think we're ever gonna gonna minimize. The, there's families of of you know, of, of six and, and four and five that need larger containers and there's families of one or two that need smaller containers. So there's always gonna be a range of sizes, I think, in general. Yep, though, though in general, don't, doesn't uh, the concept of individual portion packing uh, generally uh, elicit negative reactions from uh, recycling uh, or uh, sustainability advocates? So it does, but um, the problem is, is, is we're reacting to what's visible out there. So um, what we should be looking is at what could make the biggest impact. And some of those small packages are making a very small impact. And, and, and they may be ending up in the landfill and taking up such a tiny amount of space. But the problem is, is they're, they're visible, right? You see them if somebody drops them on the street or whatever. But 
if you spend all your time and energy on those little things, this 20 for whatever percent of food waste that's going into the landfill landfill isn't being worked on. And to me, that's so much more important. Um, the infrastructure to recycle is, is a whole lot more important. So we tend to react to, you know, to, to what's visible and what we see and, and, and it is reactionary. It's not strategic and we need to be more strategic with what we're working on. Right, and, and of course the we in that statement from the industry point of view is a different we than the we from the consumer point of view. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, another question about single use plastics. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, there was a question earlier about California and, and uh, some of the legislation going on out there, but latest question uh, then talks about uh, potential bans on single use plastics or sing, um, and, and how, how do you define single use? And is that kind of a ban and a, a practical thing? I, mean, I, don't I guess I, I think of grocery store carry out bags as the, as the poster child of single use plastics, right? Well, um, <laughs> they, they are, but I mean, a lot of single use is a, you know, a candy bar. Um, yeah, you know, um, well, yeah, plastic straws isn't really um, that's a, that is a single use plastic, not a single use uh, packaging, but um, it's a goofy thing again yeah. to me because um, some people are are going to try to put a reclose on a candy bar wrapper, so it's not a single use. Oh, you can eat half of this now and reclose it. Um, when in reality, it's going to be it's going to be you know eaten at once. So. Um, if a product is, is meant to be eaten at once, um, again, it goes back to food waste. You're going to, you're going to put 20 candy bars in a, in a bag and not have them protected. And, you know, they're going to end up melting together or getting ruined. And, you know, you're, you're going to have food waste versus the reactionary of, of, um, Hey, we can't have one single package for a candy bar or, a, a, you know, a small piece, um, straws are, were, as mentioned in the chat. If you looked at the impact of straws, again, they're visible, but it's it's such a small impact overall um, that we did a lot. But I I think you know some of those changes in straws. So some of the cups are changing, so you don't have to use a straw. Um, some of the straws are becoming made out of out of different materials. Um, but again, I, I just think overall it needs to be strategic. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be a buzzword, single use plastic or, or plastic or, or um, non recyclable. It should, you should strictly, I mean, what do you, what do you do? What do you do with your, even, even, uh, you know, your, your company's strategy or even your, your financial strategy? It's not saving pennies. It's like, hey, where, where can I invest the most amount of my money so that it, it'll help me the most in the future? Um, and we should be looking at, plastics and packaging in the same way in food packaging. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and on, on that note, uh, I need to um, uh, wrap this up and say uh, thank you very much.